Prabhataya, can you uh, give me the... Yes, now you can uh, share the slides. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all for the academic presentations, especially Madam Lalam Senaratna, who is joining from the beginning of this event with us and uh, advising us on uh, how to improve our presentation skills. Today's presentation, uh, today's presenter is uh, Dr. Ashali Sena Nayaka, uh, one of the registrars from the uh, Guns and Roses batch, and uh, you all know who she is. And uh, I would like to invite her to present her case on a patient with a fast beating heart rate. Thank you, Prabhataya. Thank you, Lalanta Madam, for joining and all my colleagues. Uh, so today, uh, my patient is an 84-year-old uh, retired teacher. He presented with a feeling of an increased heart rate. Uh, and he also said it was more prominent on the left side of his chest, and especially he's uh, sleeping onto the left side. This has been happening for the past two weeks duration. Uh, he also complained of increased fatigue uh, during the same uh, time. So with this little uh, history, what are the top differential diagnoses that come to your mind? Uh, can somebody tell? Okay, so these were the uh, ones we uh, thought of, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, arrhythmias, anxiety, panic disorder, anemia, also increased coffee intake, hyperthyroidism, uh, a pneumonia, also uh, patients who are using asthma medication. And uh, so what more will you ask in the history of the presenting complaint in this patient? Can somebody suggest? Yeah, so this patient is complaining of a, uh, abnormal meeting of the heart, isn't it? So uh, we have to uh, elaborate on the, uh, you know, ask about the duration onset and uh, the progression. Yes, very, uh, very good. And also what makes it worse and, uh, you know, anything which relieved the uh, uh, palpitation and also any associated symptoms with the palpitations, for example, chest pain, mm -hmm. uh, pain syncope, yes. uh, vomiting, sweating, uh, and also uh, depending on the differentials we just discussed, uh, even sort of fear of death, something yes. like that. Yes, very good. And uh, just to, you know, say a few. Yeah, thank you, Shane. So uh, this is the summary. Uh, so like I said, he was uh, have, he having the feeling of uh, thumping of the heart for, uh, for two weeks. And on further inquiry, I found that he also had a chest pain for the same time duration, but it was more of an atypical chest pain. Uh, there was no relationship with the exercise or any radiation. Uh, also, uh, he did say that there was a mild increase in sweating more than usual. But he did not complain of any loss of weight or heat intolerance or change in bubble habits. Uh, and there were no symptoms of dyspnea related to exertion or rest. Uh, there was no uh, history of uh, cough or recent hospital admissions with fever history. There was no increase in thirst uh, or urination. And also patient did not complain of any uh, asthma or asthma medication use. So uh, in the past medical history, I forgot to tell uh, this patient when he came, uh, he did say that uh, he lost all of his medical documents uh, due to his moving of houses. So he, uh, he had a very little documents. So from that only I gathered this little bit of history. Uh, he was uh, suffering from dyslipidemia since 2011, and also he had a myocardial infarction in 2011. 
Uh, and in the surgical history, I found one uh, place where they have mentioned that he has undergone a CABG in 2011 and also an aortic valve replacement, replacement in the same procedure. So uh, there was no significant family history. Uh, he was on atvastatin and aspirin. Uh, there was no specific allergic history. Uh, he was not a smoker. And he was an occasional alcohol uh, drinker. Uh, he said he would take a <clears throat> glass of alcohol like if, uh, once in two months, maybe 250 milliliters of alcohol. But he said he would never miss his uh, cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, he did not seem, uh, there were no uh, signs of uh, depression, but he did show very mild anxiety while he was talking. And financially, he seemed stable because he got a pension from his uh, teaching job and also his son was helping them. Uh, he was taking a normal balanced diet. He was uh, never a vegetarian. Uh, on examination of the patient, uh, he, he was very well dressed and very good eye contact and uh, uh, functionally he was very independent even though he was 84 years old. He actually came alone. His BMI was 22, blood pressure was uh, 140 by 70. He wasn't febrile, no, uh, not pale, no tremor, no ankle edema. And there was uh, nothing suggestive of uh, infective endocarditis or rheumatic fever. There was no visible goiter. But uh, his pulse rate was a little bit high, so I actually uh, checked it twice. Uh, both time it was varying between 100 and 110 uh, beats per minute with normal volume. Uh, and there was a discrepancy between the heart rate and the pulse rate. Uh, so patient was mildly anxious, as I told. In the CVS proper examination, there was no increased uh, JVP. Uh, there was no displaced apex beat, uh, no parasternal heave, no palpable thrills. On auscultation, there was a mild variable intensity of this one sound, uh, but the heart sounds were irregular no loud P2, uh, no abnormal crepitation suggestive of heart failure, and abdomen, there was no abnormalities found. Um, so with all this information, uh, what are the investigations you would like to perform on him? Can somebody suggest? ECG? Yes, yes, very good. Thyroid functions, T4, TSH, as you, uh, uh, I mean, hypothyroidism, you consider hypothyroidism, can't we do T4, TSH? Yes. Well, let's but, can put a full blood count also there. Yes, very good, yes. And perhaps uh, uh, need a food echo. Yeah. Later on, later on yeah. Yeah, so at that point, these are the investigations we did. We uh, performed the ECG, uh, drop by dropping in a random blood sugar, TSHT4, full blood count, CRP. Also, we sent for a lipid profile. Chest X-ray was also done, even though there was no feature suggestive of a, a respiratory tract infection. I was scared of missing a atypical uh, pneumonia and also fasting blood sugar. So uh, these are the uh, results of the investigations. I will leave it here. Can somebody see say the abnormality we find here? Absent P waves? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not the real original uh, ECG. I have actually mistakenly lost it. So I uh, got this from the internet. I found the, like something similar to it, but it's not the same. Anyway, so like, uh, yeah. sorry. Yes, SVT, SVT. Yeah, so uh, the rhythm is irregular and P waves are not visible and uh, the ventricular rate was around 100 to 110. So everything else was normal. And this is the chest X-ray. There was no abnormality found here. So with, all, with the results, uh, what would you think as your working diagnosis? And what would be the next step in the management of this patient?
it is supraventricular tachycardia as a general practitioner we can do the sign massage neck massage i mean the sin, sinus node massage but only one side mm -hmm. not the both sides or we can keep eyes over the forehead i mean around the no the base of the nose yeah uh, or we can do the uh, syringe i mean the valsalva maneuver that uh, give a 10c 10c syringe to the patient and uh, tell him to uh, blow into that syringe until the uh, that piston piston come uh, uh, come out that that man also yeah. any any anything like that we can try before yes. going to drug treat drug management it's called as modified valsalva okay. modified valsalva yeah yeah right thank you so uh, what we did was we uh, referred the patient to the cardiology clinic and uh, then we asked the patient to come back with the investigations so he did come back and they have done halter monitoring on him and they are they have found a persistent atrial fibrillation with intermittent first degree AV block and the atrial ectopics originating from the pulmonary vein and irregular irregular heart rate with missing P waves. So he was diagnosed as a atrial fibrillation patient and the management was started. Uh, so with the results and the diagnosis uh, before going ahead with the management, what are the two uh, main evaluations we should uh, do on this patient at this stage? We will check the risk of uh, getting a cerebrovascular event. Yes. Very good. Yeah, so uh, those were done. Uh, the scores were here are here. So I will definitely uh, explain all this in the later slides. I just wanted to show the uh, results. And then he was, uh, this is the management they have started, uh, four milligrams of warfarin a day. First, it was started with three and increased up to four. At the time, the last visit, the PT was three, uh, 33 and the INR value was 2.6. Uh, he was asked to monitor his INR uh, regularly. And uh, but the insertion of a pacemaker was not included, obviously, because he was asymptomatic. And this gentleman actually uh, wrote these questions in a paper and came. Uh, he wanted to, it was like the cardiology clinic was very busy, and I have a few questions. And these are the questions he asked. He asked me, What is atrial fibrillation? And what are the complications of it? And for how long he should continue offering and whether he should worry about it, whether there are any bad things that can happen. Also, what will happen if he misses a dose? So we'll start with what is atrial fibrillation. So basically, uh, atrial fibrillation occurs when a rapid disorganized electrical signal uh, causes the atria to fibrillate. So fibrillate means like it contracts very fast, irregularly. So uh, in AF, the blood pools in the atria, but is not pumped completely to the ventricles. So as a result, the heart's uh, atria and the ventricles don't work together as they should. So this is the most common cardiac arrhythmia disorder in the world. So right now I have, uh, have attached all the reference at, in the last uh, slide. So uh, there are about 43 million people affected globally and they expect uh, by 2050, uh, it to be around 72 million people. So this uh, this graph I found pretty interesting. Uh, this shows uh, how with age, atrial fibrillation prevalence increases. And also you should note that there is a gap between men and women. And uh, that is pretty prominent where they show uh, there is a higher prevalence in men. So this is a study done among 1.9 million men and women. So the this thing is at the bottom I have attached. And I was pretty interested to find the prevalence in Sri Lanka, but uh, uh, what I found is they have there have not been a study done in Sri Lanka as a whole, but they have done in the northern uh, part of Sri Lanka, but that is also still ongoing. But uh, since our country, has a very considerable population with rheumatic mitral valve disease. 
they think it will be similar to the Western rates and perhaps even higher. So uh, let's do a classification of etiologies of atrial fibrillation. Uh, so the most common one, cardiac and non-cardiac, like uh, under cardiac, we can think of valvular diseases, myocardial infarction, uh, cardi cardiomyopathy, uh, non-cardiac, under-respiratory, uh, COPD, pneumonia, and pulmonary embolism. Uh, endocrine causes such as hyperthyroidism and diabetes mellitus. Also, we can think of acute infections, uh, electrolyte imbalances like hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia. Also, certain drugs like bronchodilators and thyroxine. And we can't forget the lifestyle factors such as excessive caffeine intake and obesity and also being a male. Actually, there are a few uh, uh, classifications of etiologies. I found three to be very interesting and I thought it will be uh, valuable for us in clinical scenarios. So the next classification I took are these. I mean, this is more for, I guess, for MCQs. Uh, this uh, according to the pathophysiological mechanisms, there are four categories, catecholamine uh, excess, atrial distension, and abnormality of conducting system, and the fourth category is increased atrial automaticity. Uh, then we can classify atrial fibrillation itself. Uh, we can say valvular and non-valvular atrial fibrillation. The name itself describes it. The other important one is according to the duration of the atrial fibrillation. Uh, so here it's the three Ps we say. Uh, it's the paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, per persistent and permanent. In paroxysmal, uh, these are recurrent episodes lasting for more than 30 seconds and they terminate spontaneously uh, or with interventions within seven days. So we can use the pill in the pocket regime for this. In persistent atrial fibrillation, it fails to self-terminate within seven days. But if it lasts for more than 12 months, then we can call it as long-standing persistent AF. In permanent, uh, it's usually the sinus rhythm cannot be restored or maintained. And uh, also we can classify it according to the symptoms. Uh, this is very important because in symptomatic patients, obviously, you get the typical symptoms of AF. But in asymptomatic patients, there are no symptoms. So patient is not actually aware that he's having this condition and they are at a very high risk of uh, getting a stroke, actually not knowing. So uh, I would touch a little bit on pathophysiology. Uh, uh, here, the electrophysiological changes in the atrial myocardium seen in AF are actually not completely understood. There, are, there is a concept known as uh, trigger and maintenance. The trigger is the initial focus of a rapid atrial firing that triggers the onset of AF. So usually it's around the pulmonary vein, but also it can occur due to premature atrial complexes and other arrhythmias. And maintenance is in persistent AF, once the trigger is being triggered, the alteration in the atrial myocardium enables the maintenance of the abnormal arrhythmia. So this can be due to fibrosis, inflammation, uh, re-entrant circuits. So basically, it, uh, uh, it, 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 the mechanisms can change according to the etiology. And talking about the clinical features, uh, these are the symptoms like palpitations like the patient that came to me and shortness of breath, angina, lethargy, and uh, they can also have tachycardia and hypotension. So uh, how do you approach a atrial fibrillation patient? Uh, before actually going into that, uh, I want to talk about the guidelines. So these are the guidelines I actually uh, referred. So these guidelines actually show very nicely how to uh, how everything is done, but they're pretty long. So uh, in an emergency, uh, anybody would like to have a easier one. So for that, I use the 2021 CAEP Acute Atrial Fibrillation Best Practices Checklist. So <clears throat> this was actually taken from the Otava Handbook of in, uh, Emergency Medicine. And the latest... Uh, Guidelines were updated in uh, 2021 on the 6th of June. Uh, 
uh, if you forget all of this, we can think of this uh, mnemonic I found. Uh, it's actually AFib itself. You can, A is for whether it's A for another rhythm. F is whether it's fast from a secondary cause or a primary cause. Then I for interventions. Are we going ahead with a rhythm or a rate control? And the last one, blood thinner for the anticoagulation. So talking about the CAEP uh, checklist, best practice, uh, these are the four main categories. So from now on, the slides will be according to this. Uh, the first one is the assessment and risk stratification. Uh, second is rate and rhythm control. Third is stroke prevention. D is uh, follow-up. So talking about the assessment and the risk stratification, uh, first, we have to find whether this rapid ventricular response is it from a secondary cause or a primary cause. So, uh, rapid rates, uh, rate secondary to medical causes are usually by sepsis, uh, bleeding, pulmonary embolism, and heart failure, etc. So, these should be investigated and treated uh, aggressively. Uh, cardio version might be harmful here. And also, we should avoid aggressive rate control. So, primary arrhythmias are sudden onset of atrial fibrillation. Uh, so, how to find whether the rapid rate is more likely to be a secondary to an underlying medical cause? Uh, well, if the patient has fever, dyspnea, pain, or a heart rate less than 150, and also he doesn't have a history of uh, previous cardioversions. So uh, anyway, to find this, we have to start off with investigations. And like we discussed earlier, we uh, start with the same investigations. I would like to emphasize a little bit on the ECG uh, because an ECG actually helps us to find whether this is an actual atrial fibrillation or not. So the two mistakes we do here is overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. So in uh, overdiagnosis, what we do is we apply the label of atrial fibrillation to act what actually is a sinus dysarrhythmia or a sinus tachycardia or even a baseline artifact. In underdiagnosis, we apply the label of sinus tachycardia or SVT to actually what is an atrial fibrillation. So we need to avoid these mistakes. So for that, I think we should be very good at reading ECGs. And uh, so these are the ECG uh, specific findings in atrial fibrillation. Uh, there are no P waves, irregularly irregular RR intervals, and uh, variable ventricular rate, and the absence of an isoelectric baseline. Also, you can find fibrillatory waves that may be present either in fine or coarse form. Uh, the fibrillatory waves, the here I have put a picture with a yellow, I'm um, sorry, green color arrow. Uh, this can, we can actually mimic uh, and mis mimic P waves and uh, it can lead to misdiagnosis. And here I have uh, put three uh, pictures of a normal sinus rhythm, an atrial fibrillation <clears throat> and atrial flutter. So uh, I would like to just talk a little bit about atrial flutter just to overcome any confusion because uh, this is also pretty common. The difference is in, actually in AFib, the heart beats fast and in, a, in not in a regular pattern or rhythm, but with atrial flutter, the heart beats fast in a regular pattern. So you can see that the distinct sawtooth pattern in the atrial flutter ECG. Uh, so imaging, like, uh, yeah, so like we did with this patient, we can always do a chest X-ray to find any uh, lung disease, uh, pulmonary edema. Uh, also, we can do CT, MRI, uh, to, if we suspect of any embolic event, and also echocardiography uh, to find any structural heart disease. Uh, well, then next we have to check whether the patient is stable or not, but actually all this should go parallelly, even though, you know, I take point by point, obviously the patient stability should be checked at a very initial stage. So instability due to acute primary uh, atrial fibrillation is pretty uncommon. 
except in uh, except for atrial fibrillation with uh, ventricular pre-excitation. So these patients are usually having hypotension, uh, systolic less than 90, and cardiac ischemia, marked ST depression, more than two millimeters, and pulmonary edema, like dyspnea, crackles, and hypoxia. So we have to treat the unstable patients. We can use urgent electrical cardioversion if it's the onset is less than 48 hours. But if it's more than 48, uh, we will have to consider a trial of rate control. So uh, this question, can somebody answer? Is it safe to cardiovert a patient with primary atrial fibrillation? Okay, so answer is uh, yes, if the patient is adequately anticoagulated for a minimum of, minimum of three weeks. But if he's not, you still can uh, cardiovert. If the patient has no history of a stroke or a TIA and does not have valvular heart disease and also the onset uh, less than 48 hours. If it's available, we can obviously do a, a transesophageal echocardiography uh, or a thrombus. And obviously, it should be negative. So another question, can somebody please answer? Is it safe to rate control a patient with primary atrial fibrillation? Not rhythm, rate control. Okay, so the answer is yes. When a patient is older with minimally symptomatic, with mildly elevated heart rate, we can go ahead with rate control. So since we uh, spoke about uh, rate and rhythm, uh, I would like to just touch a little bit on that. So in rate control, the medication we can use are calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. That's the first line. And digoxin in the second line. But we should remember to avoid calcium channel blockers if the patient is having acute heart failure or a known LV uh, left ventricular dysfunction. So the heart rate target is uh, at rest. It should be less than 100, uh, walking less than 110 beats per minute. In rhythm control, there are two ways, pharmacological and electrical, uh, DC cardioversion. Uh, so this is the algorithm for cardioversion in AF. Uh, I got it from the European Society of Cardiology Guidelines. So um, I'm not going to go into detail in this. We can have a look at it after the presentation. Um, is pre-treatment with rate control agents recommended or not before cardioversion? What do you think? Uh, the answer is it's not recommended uh, because it's ineffective and delays the treatment. So now we are at the third uh, point, prevention and complications. So, hello. So complications, again, uh, we can uh, categorize into cardiac and non-cardiac. Cardiac, cardiac uh, like ischemia, sudden cardiac arrest, and tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. Non-cardiac, uh, there's thromboembolic events like stroke, TIA, and collapse. Uh, so how do you prevent thromboembolic events? So basically, in AF patients, there is a stasis of blood, which forms uh, blood clots. And obviously, this gives the thromboembolic events. To reduce this, you have to start on anticoagulation. So there are two main types of anticoagulation. It's vitamin K antagonists, such as warfarin, and direct-acting oral anticoagulants, DOATs. These are, uh, these are new agents. So there's a big difference because in vitamin K, you have to monitor with regular INRs. But in uh, DOACs, you don't have to monitor. And But unfortunately, there are some people who can't use both of this. Either they don't tolerate or it's contraindicated. So then they are left with uh, using uh, left atrial appendage obtusion devices. 
So like I said, uh, some people are contraindicated for using oral anticoagulations. This is called the MacMaster checklist. This is also part of the uh, uh, checklist I'm using. So absolute, absolute contraindications are already on anticoagulants and current serious bleeding. Relative ones are the patient is already prescribed with two antiplatelets, such as clopidogrel or aspirin. And there had been a recent serious bleeding, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, low platelet count and low hemoglobin count. Uh, so how do we uh, how do we uh, assess a patient uh, whether he's at a higher risk of stroke? So there is a, a scoring system, the one I was talking about earlier, Chad Vasco and the Chad scoring system. Actually, the newer one is the uh, first one I told, but I thought of talking about both of them because in guidelines that I mentioned, some guidelines use uh, the Chad's two scoring system still. So just to uh, prevent any uh, doubt, I thought of talking about both of them. Uh, so the only difference is the newer one, the Chad Spasco system. There are three additional factors. That is the female gender, uh, age between 65 to 74, and the vascular events. These are the three, uh, three new additions they have included. And, and the other change is uh, they have they added one more point because earlier if the age was uh, more than 75, they gave one point, but now they give two points for that. So here you can see very clearly. Uh, Rashali, Rashali uh, yes. is it okay yes. if I interrupt you? Uh, is it okay? Yeah. I have some question. Uh, can you go yes, back sir. to the previous slide? Uh, uh, in one slide you, have ma you mentioned that uh, atrial fibrillation, when compared with men and women, uh, women has a very low prevalence compared to men. You know, it's a normal thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, why, according to the, the second score, why they have considered this? I mean, so this is a uh, risk. Uh, I mean, risk, this is risk yeah. assessment of strokes, right? But yeah. why they have? Uh, I mean, uh, included female and given a one, one plus score rather mm -hmm. than uh, Actually, that's um, a very mm -hmm. good question, Teklanyaki. Um, when I was making the PowerPoint, I, I, I kind of thought about it. I have, uh, in the later slides, I have mentioned that. So uh, when I get there, I will uh, definitely answer that question. Okay, okay thank you, Rashali. Yes. Okay. Um, so here, um, you can see that uh, with the scoring system, when, when it's increasing, uh, <clears throat> The risk of uh, annual stroke is also increasing. You can nicely see it. And uh, so be, so there are uh, three scores that we have to keep in mind. Uh, zero, one, two or more. So in Chad Vasco, if it's zero, you don't need to start uh, anticoagulation. If it's one, sometimes you start. Sometimes you uh, only start aspirin. Sometimes you start oral anticoagulation. But if it's two or more, you definitely start it. So we will see why that is. Actually, this dilemma in the score of one also something I, I couldn't, when I was making the slides, I was kind of confused. So what I did was I uh, hope this is right because I went through all the guidelines and tried to make sense of it. So since these uh, guidelines use both of these scoring systems, I put one on each side. So the Chad, Chad scoring system, that is what they use in NICE guidelines. They say if the <clears throat> score is more than two or two, you definitely start anticoagulation. But if it is uh, less than two, say it's zero, you don't. But if it is one, uh, you start only if that patient is uh, if the pa the patient got the scoring of one because he's seven more than seventy five years old. So then, even though the scoring is one, you start. But if the patient just got the scoring of one just because he has diabetes, then you don't start. But for this specific factor that the patient is more than seventy five years, you start. And also, uh, they take these minor criterions of the newer one. So here in the newer one, they say the chat vet score, if it's one, you uh, do start oral anticoagulation under one exception. Because if this uh, score of one is due to the gender alone, that is for being male, sorry, for being female, uh, you have to consider this. 
if the female that who got the score of one is under the age of 65 without any other risk factor, uh, you can actually avoid antithrombotic therapy for that particular score. I hope it makes sense. Um, so what uh, Reklaniaki asks, why women have a lower incidence and prevalence of AF while experiencing a higher risk of complications? So I found this very interesting. So um, actually uh, for this, we don't have direct answers. They have, they have uh, concepts going on. So the first one is uh, the males usually have a larger left atria and an increased left ventricular wall thickness, uh, which is very much associated with increased risk factor, risk factor of uh, atrial fibrillation, while women generally have a reduced ventricular wall thickness and a smaller left atria. So there's one point for women for being protected from AF. And the other one is, uh, there are a lot, but these are the few main things I thought of mentioning. Uh, the women are like, when you, when you take the height, uh, men have a, are taller. So being tall is also a risk factor for atrial fibrillation. And uh, that is one point. And the other one is estrogen. This of course very controversial, but a lot of uh, research they say uh, estrogen has a uh, uh, like uh, it 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 has a benefit uh, for women for not having atrial fibrillation. So again, this is another world uh, this thing that uh, shows atrial fibrillation prevalence in every country. Uh, men has a higher prevalence, except in Iran. I honestly don't know why they are, women have more prevalence than in men. But every other country, it's the other way around. So again, uh, females, uh, even though they have a low incidence of uh, atrial fibrillation, they have a higher risk factor for stroke in atrial fibrillation. So here also, they have done a small study and found that uh, women have more atrial fibrosis. So that itself can be the reason uh, compared to men for, that is because of these markers i have written it you can read it later so if women have a higher rate of atrial fibrosis in atrial fibrillation this would contribute to the abnormal atrial substrate and atrial cardiopathy that may contribute to stroke these are the only two definitions they have given for that so now let's talk about the bleeding risk so bleeding risk also have a lot of uh, scoring systems uh, in ECS guidelines, they have used HASBLED, and in NICE guidelines, they have used OBIT. So these are the uh, interpretations of how to find the bleeding risk. And catheter ablation is a tertiary care this, uh, thing. It's an invasive therapy. It's a newer one for uh, atrial fibrillation patients. Now follow up. Now this is really important for us. Uh, so when a patient comes with atrial fibrillation for follow-up, we should always see uh, whether we should uh, recommend them for cardiology follow-up in the four, four to six weeks uh, if they have already not. And also if we start a new medication, which can have interaction with any of the drugs he's on, they sh we should again uh, refer them for cardiology follow-up. And we can also provide them with handouts uh, describing about this, what is these medications and what is atrial fibrillation like this uh, old gentleman asked. And also if the patient is on DOAC, we should do early follow-up on uh, renal function. Uh, then we should do a stroke assessment, stroke risk ass assessment, and we can assess the adequacy of rate control we can also develop action plan for recurrent or uncontrolled symptoms. And uh, we can identify and manage risk factors for atrial fibrillation. So since I'm talking about atrial fibrillation, I would like to touch a little bit on warfarin. Uh, so it was found in 1920s. It's a nice history. You all can read it later. So uh, the target INRs in warfarin are usually between two to three in all uh, incidents, but uh, in uh, there is a change in uh, mechanical mitral valve, and in specific older mechanical aortic valves, they target they increase the target INR to uh, two point five to three point five. 
So warfare in monitoring, as we mentioned, is done by prothrombin time and international normalized ratio, the INR. And the drug interactions we should always consider. But there are certain drugs that increases the IN, uh, that increases the uh, effect of warfarin, and uh, some which decrease the effect of warfarin. So there are many drugs you all can read it, such as amoxicillin, cephalosporin, and uh, which decreases effect of warfarin. The rifampicin antibiotic it decreases it, and uh, some antiepileptics like carbamazepine. And the other question most of the patients ask in clinics are about food. Whenever they uh, start on warfarin, they ask, how about food? So uh, actually, some people still 200% uh, avoid uh, greeny vegetables, uh, but that's not the case. Uh, uh, that's not the case. So uh, we have to be cautious of food that contains a high uh, vitamin K, uh, this thing, uh, because uh, that can obviously affect the how warfarin works. These include greeny uh, leafy vegetables like broccoli, katrumurunga, um, and, uh, and also uh, avocado, olive oil. These kind of certain categories of food has uh, more vitamin K. So what we can do is we can eat similar amounts at similar intervals. Uh, so when we do this without entirely avoiding it, uh, we can uh, take that certain amount uh, of that vegetable without 100% avoiding it. So this will uh, keep the level of vitamin K in the blood fairly constant. And then it makes it more likely that your INR levels also stay stable. And... When we talk about complications of warfarin, uh, you can think about hemorrhages, warfarin embryopathy, warfarin necrosis, osteoporosis, and purple toe syndrome. So warfarin monitoring, uh, I put this algorithm, this is very easy to understand. Uh, uh, you start warfarin and then the first few days you check the INR every two to four days. And then once you reach two consecutive therapeutic INRs, you can just uh, start just using, uh, monitoring it weekly. And again, if you need to do a dose adjustment, you go back to uh, square one and start again. And then you decrease it up to four weeks uh, monitoring. And managing overdose, uh, I, I just touch it up a little bit. If it's less than 1.5 uh, in an emergency, And if the INR is between five to nine, you can actually omit one to two doses, then recheck it. Uh, yeah, so the last question he had was, what happens if you miss a dose? So uh, if you miss a dose, and if you remember it within 12 hours, you can take it. But if it's more than 12 hours, there you're not supposed to take the missed dose, but you can take the scheduled dose for the current day. And uh, you can meet with your doctor if uh, necessary. And also you have to be sure that you mention this to your doctor in the next visit. And you should never double up on your dose to make it up for the missed dose. And you can never change the dose unless your doctor has uh, prescribed it. So about surgeries, when you're on warfarin, uh, what we do is they start on bridging anticoagulation. I'm not going to go into very much detail on it, but this is not needed for every surgery because there are three types. And if it's a very high risk for thromboembolism, you definitely need to do bridging. Uh, and if it's intermediate, uh, it depends by case by case. Uh, for low risk, you actually don't need to do bridging. Uh, also, now the newer drugs, now uh, oral uh, anticoagulants, NOAX so, and DOAX, the same thing. So talking a little bit about it is uh, that is much superior to warfarin and uh, it reduces the stroke and systemic embolism and which causes the overall mortality. And this is largely due to the fever hemorrhagic st strokes by these drugs. And they have very fewer drug-to-drug -drug interactions than warfarin. And the drugs that we should really uh, avoid while on them are ketoconazole, verapamil, amiodarone, and clarithromycin, and so on. 
Also here, again, rifampicin uh, has an effect which reduces the drug levels. And uh, these are the drugs like apexibam and uh, edoxaban. So uh, these NOAC, who are the people that it's considered for, the, the people who have uh, poor venous access and difficulty receiving regular INR monitoring. And also some people uh, can't adhere to those uh, dietary interactions or dietary uh, regulations of warfarin. So people who are contraindicated for NOAC are people with mechanical prosthetic valves and patients with moderate to severe mitral stenosis. So if a patient is introduced to this as family physicians, we can actually talk to them about their benefits and downfalls. So benefits of NOAX are the reduction in the number of clinic visits. And also uh, that is because there is no need of regular blood diagnostications and time saving. And also NOAX have fewer food and drug interactions as compared to warfarin. The downfalls are NOAX are definitely more expensive than warfarin. And sometimes some local pharmacies may not have them in stock. And the other main point is NOACs generally have a short life, uh, half life. So non-compliance to the twice a day regime and skipping medication uh, may quickly result in prothrombotic state. Uh, so how do you make the switch from warfarin to NOAC? So generally it's very simple. Actually this is done by the hematology team. So what they do is they stop the warfarin until INR drops below two at which time the patient can start on the NOAC. Uh, here, you don't need to worry about any bridging uh, therapy for surgeries when you're on NOAC. So what you can do is you can stop it 18 to 48 hours before and then uh, resume it after six to seven, between 6 to 72 hours post-operatively, depending on the surgery type. Uh, so here... Uh, can somebody tell, like, with all this information, I know it's a lot, but with the patient's history, uh, uh, these are our patients, what could be the underlying cause for the AF development? Uh, well, it's uh, it could be valvular disease because he had aortic valve replacement in 2011. And also he could have had rheumatic heart disease, which he would not know. And uh, <clears throat> also myocardial infarction, which he had in 2011, which could have resulted in the first degree AV block. And also being a male. So the pathophysiological origin of the AF it was shown in his auto monitoring, the atrial ectopics originating from the pulmonary veins. So these were the references. Thank you. Hello. Madam. Hello, Rashali. Uh, because I'm asking this, this question, I'm going to add some points to your offering management. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me, Rashali? Yeah, yeah. My father is on offering for some time. Uh, have you heard of advices that uh, regarding IEM injections like tetanus because this uh, because my father had uh, they had to give the COVID vaccine, then only I also read it. There are some guidelines revised by the hematologists regarding the uh, vac vaccination, especially IEM. Yes. When the, the when the patient is on warfarin, I think I can't exactly remember. Uh, have you read it? Because I, I in our value, I think it should be some level less than four or something like that. We have yeah. to educate our patients, no? Yes, Before definitely. getting uh, IM injection, so and also blood drawing, also to carry ice pack or like that, we have to educate. I think we have to at that point. 
yes, thank you, Tatan. As I will, yeah. I will yeah. add it. Uh, hello, Rashali. Yes, in here. Yes, yes, no. In pregnancy, how do we um, approach planned or unplanned if on offering? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually uh, that in uh, when you're taking warfarin, they tell you to uh, avoid warfarin in the uh, first trimester and uh, four and four weeks prior to the delivery. I actually. Yes, Ajna, I, yeah, I, I, uh, I read it while I was making this uh, presentation, but I'm sorry, I have not included that in this. Oh, that's fine. Thanks. I think uh, what I remember is there's a, like, the thing you said for surgery, some kind of bridging regime, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Bridging regime was also included there because yeah. obviously you can't entirely get rid of uh, warfarin and not do anything about it. The bridging regime comes uh, there. Mm. Thanks. Madam, any questions? Yes, Rashali. You know, like uh, I was waiting for you all to discuss and I want to talk with you all. I mean, the finally, once you finish all your discussions, that's what I was waiting. Any, you know, like any need, any clarifications, like any questions from Rashali? I think Asian Aya's question was very good. Uh, Madam, I actually read about it. I, I, I... No, 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 Rashali, it's like this now. Okay, fine. First of all, I would like to tell uh, about your presentation. It's very good and very comprehensive, very well planned. And it's things like uh, points, of course, it's a very good presentation. But if you could uh, do it a bit slower because it's, you have, I mean, like less than one hour, you would have a little bit slow down the like sort of uh, the I mean the, the, sometimes you skip some slides. I I think it's better if you could do that a little bit slower than the way you did. It's good anyway. It's because it's the there are facts to the baby to like it's maybe new ones. I mean especially you know the the patholo pathophysiology the things you have to do and everything because the, that is the one thing. Uh, the second thing of course only thing. As the people who are like at the primary care as consultants or whoever, that the most important thing regarding atrial fibrillation is to understand, as you mentioned correctly, is it F or something else? Second thing, is this primary or secondary? And then the correct referral at a correct time. Right, so that's the most important. Or the when you diagnose F, that's first thing. And second thing, once it's like it's safe hands, if the patient is in safe hands, as the way the exact way you did, and we know that the patient is in safe hands, once they diagnose and the diagnosis part is over, then it comes to the management plan. Right? Do we diagnose? Because it's my like by. by experience in best hospital at the moment that's what I'm, I would like to share with you all and first of all once you diagnose it with the help of cardiologists then when it comes to the management they don't do those things they refer to us for the management so then what we do is we have to do a shared care with the 
hematologist. She is or he or the person is there to help you to like do all the scores and everything and to decide what's the offering initial dosage and everything. And after that, what you have to do as correctly as Rashley mentioned, up titration and down titration. And the, the may, most important just today itself, there's a person with a offering and you know he like did a lot of things and they you know like uh, about the, the diet and everything was like he, she or, or the, the person was of course, I mean, uh, he neglected everything and come with all the problems. But anyway, you should nicely tell what are the things the person are supposed to do regarding diet and everything as uh, Teclan mentioned about some procedures and everything. So it is just the, the edu health education part. And up titration, down titration, according to the INR, as well as, you know, the things when the patient comes with a little bit of a like uh, uh, sort of a, like complications, as well as if they are not, not sure about the diet and everything, how to advise. And third thing, if you come across, for instance, for a pregnancy or before surgery, or they when they go to for us for a um, sort of a like injections or whatever the things you highlighted, it is not that like it is not your role to do anything. If you come across this type of a thing, please do a sort of a shared care with the hematologist. Please contact the hematologist, even all the other sort of a disciplines. That's how they do. Because if there's a hematologist. Definitely, the person he is because they have a very separate clinics for the like the people who are in warfarin. So they do all the best because usually they keep a book there, and we also keep a book. They see the patient once in a way, but we do the all the like maintaining part. But in those instances, we have to refer and get their advice, and we keep the patients with them once like uh, if there's a sort of complication and once it settles down only they again refer back to you so that is the most important we don't have to worry about all these sort of uh, huge things like the like the pregnancy or the like injection because we can give some advice then they if they come across or if they face for those things definitely they will come because because if they do not know what they're supposed to do they just continue the medication it's up to you to tell these are the instances you have to come back and tell all the things. Then we have the ways out. Then or only thing we have to have a, some sort of a like good relationship with the hematologist and do the needful for the patient. And the, the final part is, so that's the way he, she mentioned about the, they, are, they are a bit reluctant on like dietary habits or whatever the things they, and the, like some sort of, they are the, on some anti-epileptics, they cannot, I mean, like take warfarin. The third thing is serial like measurements. INR is very important to decide which way is going. If they're like, they are, if this, in those instances, we had to go for the oral, the other medication, as you know, I call whatever the thing for the. It's the, the I mean, the the the, the, the it's just a bit expensive, but there are instances we cannot avoid. We have to give. But if you give these options as well, now at the moment, like last week, of course, the hematologist, of course, they she mentioned that it's a good way out. It's like though it's like. The, the initial cost is high when we talk about the INR values. I mean, the, we have to do serial INRs and all these things. Ultimately, the cost is more or less similar. That's what she nicely mentioned about that. So there are things if they can afford, we can give that option. This is, I think, that is a huge like sort of the. This is the responsibility of a person who is in the primary care to nicely coordinate, and it's a coordinative care as well as like give a comprehensive care as well as the shared care. I think that is the most important lesson for you all to understand. If, if, if the First thing is the diagnosis of AF and then the what are the, the sort of, whether it's primary or secondary, if it is second, definitely we can treat the person. You know, that's the way, but there are a lot of patients who are, I mean, like high, like maybe low TSH and high T4, T3 levels and then comes the AF. And once you correct that, definitely we don't have to go for warfarin nicely. Just they will like go for a like sort of a good rhythm and the rate. 
and then we don't have to worry. So there are things we have to understand. It's good that you know everything, what they're doing in, you know, the what the hematologists do, what the cardiologists do, how they diagnose, what are the things available for the, the, uh, those speech patients. If you do not know, we are not in a position to advise them. So I think that those are the things. But if you could like do a little bit of slower, I think it's better. But anyway, it's a very nice, very comprehensive, very good presentation. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, madam. I was scared that I will be taking a lot of time. I will make sure it talks slow. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Rajat. <clears throat> thank you, madam. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, madam. Good night. Thank you, madam. Good night.